when I design, I don't, surprisingly enough, I don't really design for aesthetics. I focus almost only on ergonomics. The more comfortable a knife is in your hand, the, the better it looks as far as I'm concerned. When I, when, I, when I design something that's really fully, totally ergonomic and just focus on ergonomics, very often it looks great. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 104. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Thanks for joining the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. That's the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn more about knives and knife collecting. And our Sunday show is where we get to hear from knife designers, knife makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anybody who loves knives. You know that you are in the right place because you're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And Bob, starting off uh, today, our show is the April 19th Sunday edition of the, uh, the Knife Junkie Podcast. And got to just say quickly, man, we're coming off a high with the the town hall yesterday, five and a half hour video show on YouTube. Yeah, that was awesome. We had such a great time. We had uh, we had 20 guests scheduled. 18 were able to, to get up online. We had a couple of technical issues along the way. That being said, it was such a blast. We had uh, we had a lot of people watching and commenting and participating, and uh, we just had this constant five and a half hour cycle and rotation of knife makers and uh, knife reviewers coming on. It was great. We had, uh, we had Greg Medford, we had uh, Kevin Cleary, we had Metal Complex, we had uh, Marianne Help from, from TRM, we had Bob Terzuola, Michael Janich, Alan Alishowitz. Uh, it just was a great, great day. And more. And more. <laughs> and more, as well as three special guest co-hosts. So if you uh, yeah. didn't get a chance to watch it all or watch any of it, uh, please go to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel, thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. And the full show is archived there for you. Five and a half hours of knife fun for you to uh, to enjoy. That's right. Actually, uh, I, I'm I'm remiss in not mentioning my co-host because they really helped. It was a long period of time there. We were we were live, and they definitely uh, their presence was appreciated in their in their perspectives. Uh, we had Stasa twenty three, we had Slicey Dicey, and we had Alex Tissot of Alex's Knife Box. What a great time! We also tried one of the guests that we tried to have is a guest on this show today, uh, my interview, uh, and that's Tashi Barucha who to me is way up high in my pantheon of greatest knife designers uh, in the uh, of modern knives. I just love his work. And of course, he's also a maker. And uh, I, full faith, his knives are amazing, but I've never held one in my head. Uh, so uh, we, we tried to have Tashi come onto the show. He's a great, uh, great guy, charming, wonderful to talk to, very, very smart, and uh, thought he would be a great addition to the town hall. But I think there was some issue with with, with the Paris, with the internet, with, yeah. the, with the internet and the international uh, situation, so we'll we'll get him on uh, the live video show sometime in the future. But here I am teeing up my interview with Tashi Barucha. We had a great conversation. Uh, a very impressive person who is accomplished in in a in a totally other realm. I thought he was a full time knife maker before I talked to him, and uh, and so. It was a great conversation. I'm not going to say anything else. Let him speak for himself. Right. I was very honored and, and happy to meet him. Let's get right into that interview on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 104. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. All right. I'm here with Tashi Barucha. Tashi, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. You got it, man. I'm honored that you would uh, even be interested in what I do. Well, it's amazing. We're talking uh, to one another, kind of across the uh, across the ocean from one another during the midst of a worldwide shutdown. How is it uh, in in Paris right now? Well, I think we're a couple of weeks ahead of you guys as far as uh, where the disease, uh, you know, has has evolved, and uh, we're confined now for about three weeks, almost. And I think we're we're in for another. You know, maybe a month or a little under a month. I think they're there's they're predicting um, things to you know maybe get better sometime during early May or something. So, 
So what's your personal situation? Are you able to work on your knives right now? Or well, this... I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually a, a very part-time maker. I'm, I work in advertising. I'm a creative director. And I work for an American company called Clear Channel, which is an outdoors, out-of-home poster company. So right now, I am actually a full-time knife maker, which is perfect. I love it. I have to say, I mean, I knew that you were a, uh, I knew that you were a graphic designer, but I thought that was in your former life. I thought that that evolved into knife making, and you were no, full time. No, yeah, I get a, I get a couple hours at the shop every day after work. Mm-hmm. I run my my, uh, my own department, so I'm kind of free of how I I, uh, I use my time, uh, and I manage to compact my my work's day and and uh, you know pretty pretty early and up to about five five thirty, and then I just make my way to the shop, which is about five minutes away from work. And my, I actually live very close to, so everything is very, very close. Mm-hmm. And I get, a, I get a couple of hours, uh, two hours and a half, you know, every, every evening. And then all of, all of Friday is just shop time and sometime in the weekend, you know, if I get away, mm-hmm. um, also have a family to take care of. So just from looking at your work, to me, it is so refined and elegant and Designy and artistic. I, I don't mean to belittle it by calling it designy, but it, it has this. Uh, I mean, there's just such a an obvious flair to your work, and and there's like such an ease in in how beautifully put together they are. It's a little bit shocking to me to find out that you're not a, a full time maker. So I mean, that's that's. I imagine you're one of those people who who has mastered uh, across a, a broad category of creative uh, pursuits. Yeah, when I when I when I I sink my teeth into something, I really need to, you know, just just learn everything about it as well as I can, and and I I just won't let it go until uh, I I'm happy with the outcome and what I what I can what I can put up. So that happened for a couple of things in my life, and uh, and this one is uh, I think this one is the um, is the one where at least. I, I I never forgot. I I you know I dabbled with photography. I did some music. Uh, I've always been. I've always had some creative outlets. Uh, uh, you know, outside of my work, but this one is just it's it's stuck and it's uh, it's just getting it's it's amplifying with time and it's getting more and more important in my life and uh, yeah, it's definitely sticking. So uh, a graphic designer first, and then I guess a product designer, and that evolved into knives. How how did you come upon knives in particular? Yeah, I was not. I was never a product designer before I, I started designing knives. I was a graphic designer, so mostly uh, you know like graphic identities and uh, and mm. advertising. I worked for a, a company called DDB, which is a very creative uh, ad agency for eight eight years in my life, and um, and that's when I actually started got back into knives because I've been into knives for as long as I remember. I was maybe 12 spending whatever pocket money I had on a, on a, a plastic Spyderco. And I, I really, you know, I had a, this fascination for a very long time. And, uh, and you know, later on when you, you start working and you get a, a little more income and, and you find out there's a, a whole other world of more expensive knives, handmade knives, uh, that's when I really got bit. And, uh, and then, you know, I was designing stuff at work and uh, and and fascinated by knives, so it, it really was very natural for me to start designing knives. And uh, and then I I went from collector to designer and started working with my with my heroes, literally my my heroes. And I I went from being a fanboy to uh, you know being <laughs> these guys peer and uh, you know and and being recognized by them as one of their own. And that was that was I think one of the best uh, feelings I have had in my life. So who were those people? How how did you get your designs? How did how did you get those designs actually produced? So the first phase of of my uh, entering the knife world, I was collecting uh, from people like uh, Jens Anso. Tom Mayo is a huge hero of mine. I have a, a very uh, people people in the in the custom knife community know that I have a, a, a very decent collection of Tom Mayo knives. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, heroes, uh, like, uh, um, uh, I, I've like uh, all of those people now are, are very good friends of mine. So, uh, Gustavo, uh, Cicchini, uh, GTC mm. knives out of Brazil. Uh, Jens is, uh, Anso is from, uh, is from Denmark. Uh, and then most of the, the guys are from, uh, from the U.S. So Jim Burke, Lee Williams. 
Wow. Tom Mayo, obviously. Lucas Bernie is a very good friend of mine, too. And, um, you know, just a lot of these uh, Peter Carey, Jerry McGinnis, Michael Birch, Les George. Uh, those are the guys that I was uh, uh, that were around when I was coming up uh, as a collector. And, and that those are the guys I started uh, working with as a designer. So we would uh, I would design the knife. They would make a small batch of maybe 10 or 20 that were sold like on uh, by, by dealers like Steel Addiction. And um, and that that kind of put my name on the map as a, as a designer. I hadn't actually uh, put together anything. I, ha- I I can hardly put up a shelf at home, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not a very I'm <laughs> I'm not a crafty guy. Yeah, except now you, yeah, you actually ha- hand produce some of the most amazing knives. Right, so. right. Well, that's a nice jump to make. Yeah. So I would imagine you know you just you just listed uh you know sort of a, a dream team of mentors yeah i left a couple legends out like phil bogazuski uh-huh. uh, who passed away now and yeah. uh and bob terzola uh who's who, who i had the chance of, of doing two projects with uh two custom projects so those guys you know they were like knife gods and and they still are each one of those i would imagine you you worked with them in a slightly different way there must have been uh, how, how did your process evolve in working with these different people this was a a, a time where collaborations there were uh two guys before me who designed knives and actually collaborated with custom knife makers uh the first one was joe perella mm-hmm. he had a, a bunch of collabs did a lot of uh projects with alan and alicia Witz. and uh the other is young ma who's uh you know still active in the in the design world and has his own brand now uh that, that has um that uh, you know he, he works with react to produce his knives and 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 they, they are amazing uh, so those guys were uh, the precedents to when I started uh, designing knives. So there were at one point there were three of us, and uh, I actually forgot your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I, w- I was saying like each one of them, there's got to be a slightly different process right. in, yeah, in yeah, yeah. working with them. So that's 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 uh, it, it was really interesting because uh, I had a, a style that I I, I I had these lines that I was kind of obsessed with. And uh, that still, you know, that I still have like the little obsessions, like having a, a good blade to handle ratio, having a, a nice, a nice blade that when the knife is open, you actually wonder how it's going to fold into that that <laughs> handle. You know, uh, that was one frustration I had with with some knives. You know, folding knives when they're open, they look like folding knives because it's very often the blade is slimmer and the, you have a, a hefty handle and a, a slim blade. That was that was kind of a frustration I try to circumvent around and, and and try to solve that problem also i want i wanted my all the lines to be to follow through in the open and closed positions i didn't want anything to stick out so mm-hmm. i wanted flowing lines open and closed i wanted the knife to look good in in every every state so that's kind of what i started incorporating into into those uh designs and when i worked with a maker i obviously took whatever culture and he and 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 style he was in and and always took that into account and made a knife that resembled what he did and try to incorporate all of my obsessions in that uh, 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 oh so in the design process you incorporate some of his design cues right and then he builds it yeah i would never design knives and then pitch them to makers i would always make contact and we would talk and then i would make something for the maker and maybe go back and forth a couple of times, and then the 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 knife would be like really him and me, and each of us would grow from from that experience because they would all always uh, thank me for taking them out of their comfort zone, and and you know, hmm. and and I it's always it was very obvious to me, and 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 they would also talk about that how the work that followed the project for them was always a little different and i would obviously grow from that too when you're approaching them uh in the theoretical world and they're approaching you from the totally practical material world right and and it could be easy i mean i draw a lot of knives and i can imagine if a if an engineer looked at them they'd be like this would never work because of xyz right so you come to them with pure design obviously you know what you're what you're doing you're yeah, designing a knife more but, more. Yeah, yeah. 
you come to them with pure design and they have to interpret your design as well. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, actually the first projects were a little, you know, like that where they would say, well, you know, the detent has to be hidden. Uh, the detent track can't show when the knife is, is open. So you have to make sure that the, 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 the front of the handle will, will hide it. You know, little details like that in the couple of, in the few, 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 uh, first few projects. I learned a whole lot about mechanics and how the knife actually works in the real world. And after a while, I, I was uh, known for, you know, taking all that into account. And I, I, I went and hung out with, with guys in their shop. And I, I actually saw knives built and saw how uh, all the constraints and everything that went into that. So they were, um, uh, the, the drawings got really accurate to the point where they could actually just go ahead and make it the way it was. And then when, obviously when I started working on knives myself and, and making them, that, that was a whole new shift. And I, I got confronted to the, to the real world myself. <laughs> well, so how did that happen? How did you make that shift yourself? That was, uh, that was maybe three or four years after I started designing knives and, and I got to work with like a, a bunch of people and almost most of my, the guys I wanted to work with. And I, I, I kind of hit a ceiling where, you know, I was like, okay, this is great, but what's next? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and the more I worked with, with, with everybody and, and, all these ideas I had, I, I, I also uh, wanted maybe to, to focus on something very, more personal. And, and, and it became very obvious to me that I had to uh, make that jump. And, and you know, so I, I bought some, I rented a place and bought some equipment and uh, actually invested quite a lot. I, I sold, I had some very high-end knives and, uh, and, and watches. And I, I, I probably sold... 30 grand worth of stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and, and just, you know, invested in a, in a, a whole shop. It's amazing how you probably don't miss those watches or those knives. Maybe every once in a while. <laughs> they were, yeah, they were for the good cause. I mean, I, I, yeah. I got so much out of that. Well, so it doesn't surprise me, you know, you're an artist and uh, presumably a lifelong one that you would eventually want to take the whole process uh, into your own hands. It makes sense to me that as an artist, uh, as you are, that you would eventually want to take over the entire process right. of, of creating these things. You know, you, you kind of mastered the, um, the design process. You got some of the greats in the industry to help you put them together and in the process or not help them put to, you know, built them for you. And in the process, you learned more about the design process. Now you got to build them yourself. So how did you actually learn the skills? Uh, to to create such, for instance, beautifully ground blades. That was a that was a kind of a a leap of faith because like my my wife and a lot of my friends, like I said, uh, I have a hard time uh, screwing a bulb in the. I mean, I, I'm I'm really that bad. So my wife, who's um, uh, always, I mean, she's never she 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 told me after that she would she thought I was gonna like really fail. <laughs> and she said she was ready to pick me up and, and, you know, and, and, uh, she, she was, she was really, really impressed by the, the fact that I actually pulled it off at some point because she did not believe in, uh, for a second that I would, I would pull it off. So, um, that was, that was, it was a bet that I took, but I, <laughs> I actually never doubted that I would, uh, make it, that I would be able to, I wouldn't have done it if I had, if I didn't have this, the, you know, the absolute, uh, gut feeling that, that, I had it in me, so yeah. Uh, it was it was not not that easy. It's a lot of work, you know. Everybody everybody tell you that, and and you know, you mentioned grounding grinding blades. That is definitely something that there's absolutely no shortcut um, <laughs> possible. You know, you you if you learn the process of making a, a folder and you do it, uh, you know, with enough precision and and the right process, and you get everything right and flat and everything. You know, it, it's something you can you can get around pretty fast but uh grinding blades is like it's uh yeah before i i i, I uh, my first decent uh batch of blades probably was three years into my knife making so hmm. and and your uh the 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 kind of grinds you put on your knives don't seem to be like the easy kind <laughs> i don't know you know i've i've messed around a little bit here and there sharpening yeah, yeah. a file or two but yeah, yeah. like the grinds you put on your blades do not seem they seem like uh, something you got to get to after a while. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are definitely. I mean, I I, I love you know big swooping uh, mm -hmm. plunges, and that's something that's uh, it takes time to get to that. And uh, I'm really happy where I'm at right now. Still room for improvement. <laughs> 
Uh, always, always, but uh, it's hard for us to see. Uh, but the maker always sees it, right? So tell me about how you come up with your designs. They seem very uh, organic. They seem very uh, menacing. Before I, I, we get to that, I forgot. Yeah. You, you asked me a question that I, I, I forgot to answer. Uh, how I, I, I learned myself how to make knives. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I had a, I had a, a, a chance that very few people get. All the friends I made while designing knives and, and in the in the knife community allowed me to spend some time with some of the greatest makers in the world. So um, I have one very close to me in France called Thierry Savadan. He was the mm-hmm. first guy I went to, to, to you know, actually watch and, and see making knives. Um, he's a, He's been a great mentor to me. And then Jens Anso, I went uh, to Denmark a couple of times to work on projects and I saw the way he works. Uh, Jim Burke in Mississippi. You know, after Blade Show, we would you know drive down and and uh, and spend some some time like a, a week or so in the in the shop and just you know it was amazing times. Sometimes with Jeremy Marsh, Brian Fellholter, a whole bunch of us hung out over there. So those those were uh, experiences that really really uh, made me make giant leaps in my knife making because seeing other people work is mm. is priceless. You know, you can't. There's nothing that that can replace that. So uh, obviously, I, I, I had my own path and, and learned learned myself, uh, t- taught myself how to do a, a bunch of stuff, like everybody else. Because you know, we all get to an end product and with like a thousand different ways to get there. Mm-hmm. So everybody creates their own path. But seeing, being able to see all these uh, all those guys who are legends uh, work, that was amazing for me. So was it always just observational or did you get, did you go for actual tutelage and get lessons and that kind of thing? Well, no, they, they weren't like uh, official lessons and tutelage. Uh, it was just us hanging out and, and I, I, I just took it in. I, I would not participate except for the last project I did with Jens Anso mm-hmm. in Denmark where uh, it was a forehand project where I was then also a knife maker so i designed the project and we both built it kind of what what like what he does with uh burnley when when they work together so that was the only the only actual oh and the the project last project i did with bob truzvola also Mm -hmm. except i didn't i I, you know i shipped we shipped back and forth and we built the knives together yeah i was going to bring that up later but since you bring it up that is one of the most beautiful knives of the last you know several years that i can remember i mean for me personally that that knife hit all of my design oh i'm so glad yeah it had that sort of uh you know had that double peaked bowie blade i'm a sucker for a bowie and 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 it was so unmistakably your handle you you have some real design signatures what are your inspirations and and do you draw freehand as well as on the computer like tell me a little bit about your design process well i'm very uh comfortable with uh this uh software which is a, actually a, a logo designing software called uh, adobe illustrator which mm. uh, a lot of people use yeah. um so that's kind of that that kind of uh, uh workplace is, is like second nature to me so most of the times i will just go straight to illustrator and put my stuff together and, and it's easy sometimes uh i'll just scribble something on, on a piece of paper and then it usually gets way better when i <laughs> <laughs> when, when I throw it on the on the software, but uh, yeah, if I have like an, a, a weird idea of a, I'll just scribble it and and. But most of the times, yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie, it's it, it happens on Illustrator. One of the reasons I ask I, I ask is because I'm interested always in the mode of uh, you know how how people work when they're designing, but also a lot of the sort of organic curves in your knives seem to follow. Uh, you know, there's a certain arc that your hand will follow with your wrist when you're drawing or that your arm will follow hinging from your elbow. And it seems very natural. And uh, so you've, to me, you've sort of taken some of that real natural gesture from natural drawing and brought it into that digital space. Right. And it translates into the knives so, so nicely. It's uh, very nice of you to say that because that's, it is the intent. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more and more towards lines that look really natural. And uh, I love uh, contrast. Uh, I love I, I love tension. Uh, and uh, I always, you know, like the the, the the mood I'm in right now with the, the I have a, a model called the SOS and another called the Point Blank, which are really cousin designs. 
rooted in 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 actually um, in in buoys and and you know they like with clips and and uh, kind of uh, blades with recurves and sharp recurves that that mm-hmm. kind of uh, find their roots and 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 big big uh, like forged fighters you know hidden tank fighters uh, I have I have heroes in the knife world. From the other side, uh, like Adam DeRozier and Sam Lurkin and um, and Jason Knight, so those those mm-hmm. guys uh, make stuff that I I can't actually make myself because I I wouldn't know where to start and I don't have the equipment. So I'm fascinated by those knives now because that's what I can't do. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so and but but you know they they I do find a lot of inspiration in in what they do. So those knives are are kind of rooted into that, and I I really often compare uh a night uh, when i when i uh, i'm happy with the design i always look, find it looks like muscle you know it, it kind of looks fast mm. and and streamlined and it's uh i was um, yeah I, I i really enjoy uh having a, a design that i'm that i'm happy when it when it looks natural and it looks like organic definitely so when you're making uh these designs when you're when you're kind of dreaming them up some of them definitely have a more uh I, I want to say aggressive or menacing look, but they're always, they always look classy, you know, right. uh, you know, kind of, they always look sort of like an Italian racing boat or something, yeah. you know, while being like uh, menacing. Some of them have a, a much more obvious sort of EDC bent to them. Right. When you're designing, are you, are you starting with a purpose and going from there or, or is it more, how, how does that work? Well, I have found looking back that my knives are looking more and more menacing. That's true. Maybe because of what I just mentioned, you know, uh-huh. like the the fascination I have nowadays for for those big fighters. Um, obviously, you know, my knife my knife making and design is taking a, a turn to towards something a little more aggressive. Uh, when I got started, uh, I I live in France, so I have a I have a, a, like every French person uh, an obsession for food, uh, so. <laughs> Maybe, maybe everybody in the world actually, but no, but I, I, I was really focused on making, you know, on having very low cutting edges to be able to prep food whenever I wanted to. So, mm-hmm. uh, knives like the, um, the knife I called the church, which became the mass drop prism. Oh yeah. Well, that's a perfect example of that. It's like a pocket sound token. So you can just, you know, and I did use it a lot on, on, in, in, on holidays when I needed to like make a, a meal. And yeah, uh, these knives, the, the, the knives I've been making lately are, are more, yeah, for, for the apocalypse, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> for the classy, uh, classy denizen of the apocalypse. All right. All right. So we, we, I brought up Menace. Now I'm going to talk about Logan. <laughs> you had a couple of years ago, and, and now you, you sort of had a, um, a, a reprise of it right. with the Vincenzo Fiore uh, knife. But a couple of years ago, you made these most impressive sets of wolverine claws yeah. and you sort of uh, you brought your instagram audience through the process and <laughs> and it was amazing and i gotta say uh it was harrowing watching each one of those blades get sharpened because i'm like how many sets of those did you make like two i made three you made three I made so three, that's three large uh, three of the regular size one and one of the one small small the micro, micro claws that's just no one. your e- edc claws yeah edc yeah, wolverine yeah. claws <laughs> So that's 18 of those large blades, yeah. right? All ground exactly. Yeah. Describe, describe first of all, what those are so people can, can visualize them. And then uh, tell me about what it was like designing those and building those. Well, I, I, I have no idea where it came from. I think where it originated from and the, <laughs> was that I had this big uh, sheet of, of a CPM 154 which was way too thick for folders. I don't know how I'd come across it. And I was looking at that thing and I, I'm wondering what I would ever do with it. And at one point, I don't know how it came and it popped up and I was like, oh, maybe claws, maybe Wolverine claws, they would, that would fit. And so, so I was, I, I just designed it. And, uh, so what, what the, what the, the sets are is actually, uh, three large claws. Per uh, per handle, and they're they're all uh, the claws are, are fixed with screws to a, a pommel that you hide into your hand, and the claws kind of stick out of your um, hand like they were coming out of your flesh, like 
like Wolverine. So, like the superhero Wolverine, yeah. yeah. So, and I, I, I made three sets of those. So that's six blades, uh, two pommels. So the, yeah, you would, you would actually uh, be able to wield those claws <laughs> like a, like a crazy person. So yeah, and then I, I, I so I got the, I, I got the steel cut and then I, I went through a lot of prototyping to, to, uh, to get the claws to, you know, look to fly out of the, uh, they didn't actually deploy and retract, but, you know, they needed to look like they were uh, coming out of your hand the way the way it should. So that was uh, that was a little challenging as far as uh, as far as ergonomics. Uh, I think one of the most challenging uh, projects I ever did. And after I got to that, uh, yeah, I got the part the the blades cut and and got right to it. I don't have them with me. I would have <laughs> loved to show them to you. Even well, who it do, do you have? Do you have them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a private showing. Yeah. Do you have them all? Are they yours? No, no, there are uh, two, two sets were sold at uh, Blade Show, uh, I forget which year, two years ago, maybe, and the following uh, USN Gathering. So one, one at each show, they were uh, auctioned. And so you recently did this uh, collaboration with Vincenzo Fiori, uh, a, a, a famed Italian ballet song maker. Uh, yes. Tell me a little bit about that one. It's also called Logan, right? It's uh, yeah, it's 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 based on the same uh, kind of uh, blade profile, uh, which is a a long. It's not a one cliff. It's a hawkbill, hawkbill. Mm -hmm. When yeah, it's a, a full recurve blade. And um, with a, a nice clip on top, which is really reminiscent of, uh, of the Logan Claws. And uh, that was a fun project because uh, I, I actually met Vincenzo at the Paris show last year, uh, the CCAC. And, uh, you know, I went up to him and, and told him how, uh, actually, he came up to me. We, we had connected on Instagram and we had decided to, you know, meet each other at, at the CCAC because uh, we were both fans of each other. And uh, right then and there, we decided we needed to get something going. And uh, I love ballet songs. I've never actually designed a ballet song because uh, the, the the way I put it is that if I can't do it better than Charles Marlowe, uh, I don't want to. I don't even want to try. So, right. and, and I think he's. I mean, his badger is something that I would have loved to come up with. Unfortunately, I'm not the genius he is. So he yeah, he he did it. He beat me to it. So. <laughs> I would I would do it, but he did it. So <laughs> yeah, he's one of my. I, I have a Boker, uh, yeah. just because it's designed by him. It's right. a beautiful, beautiful work. So yeah, he's a, he and for he 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 kind of killed that market for me because he does it too well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and so when Vincenzo, uh, you know, said he was he was down to do a project, uh, his it was his idea actually to incorporate the the, the that blade because. Uh, the, the way he makes the, the, the Bali song is really to be able to flip it as well as he can. And, and you need a very slim blade to fit those handles because the handles, the way he does it, uh, those are not going to change or, you know, can mm -hmm. make them wider or anything. That's, it's the, they are the way they are to be able to, to, you know, to flip them as well as he does. So we needed to, to put a, a very slim blade in, into that. So he said, you know, you, a, uh, because before the the Logan claws came out, I had a I had done a little friction folder. Uh, mm -hmm. It was integral full carbon fiber, one piece handle, and uh, and it had that same kind of blade profile in it. So he kind of uh, bounced off of that and said we could put a, a blade that looks like that into into my handle. So um, so I went straight to designing that um, blade. Uh, taking into account all the, the mechanics he has, because he uh, he came up with this great system for ballet songs, which um, doesn't involve any type of pins. So he he mm -hmm. had a pinless design uh, where the uh, blade stops are incorporated into the handle and not pins that are either in the blade or the handle. So that's that's really smart. And uh, you know he just sent me his system, and I I designed the blade, and that went straight into the into the the body song handles and the project came out amazing i love it so how do you decide what kind of projects you also work a lot with riot and uh at, you know at oem company or maybe maybe a collaborator is a better a better term right the way i i work with them is mm -hmm. actually I, I i will design knives that they put out through the riot brand so i'm not i'm not 
uh, commissioning anything from them. So they're, they're so you are a them. designer for them. Yeah. So how does that um, dictate what you're going to design? Do they say, hey, Tashi, we want we want an EDC uh, flipper in this size range, you know, how does that work? Well, they kind of pursued me so for a while. So nice. So, so I get to be the I get to be the diva in that relationship. But no, <laughs> I, I really love. I mean, I have a great great relationship with David. But he did pursue me for a couple of months, uh, maybe a year before I accepted to do anything. I don't know why I was reluctant. I I uh, I always knew that I wanted to have production. Uh, you know, stuff out there because uh, I knew that I needed to broaden the audience that, you know, uh, it's very niche. Uh, where you just make custom knives and you have this. It's a very, it's a great community of, of uh, dealers and collectors and makers, but it's it's pretty small. So right. I, at some point I knew I had to branch out and, and make stuff that was more available to most more people. I just, uh, I just didn't know. I just wanted to, the, the perfect you know, uh, opportunity to work with the, the best people possible. So I was, yeah, I was, I was kind of not, I, I didn't dive into it, but at some point a lot of people recommended them to me. And, uh, and I was like, okay, so if I'm going to do something, I guess these are the right people to do it mm -hmm. with. But I, I, I kind of, uh, what I wanted is to, uh, pitch something to them that, uh, that I couldn't possibly make in my own shop something completely different and uh, and a challenge. So my first project was with them was the Future, which was a, a one-piece handled pocket katana. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, it's got a – the flipper is sort of integrated into the tang in such a way that you don't even see that it's yeah, a flipper you know, when it's yeah, open. Yeah, you don't see it. But it's not – like it doesn't stick out. So it's a yeah, – yeah, yeah, so yeah. that was – that was a, so that's an integral folder. Uh, I'm not equipped to make any of that. So mm – -hmm. and I, I went – nuts with all the uh, all the milling and the sculpturing on the on the handle i put some carbon fiber inlays and stuff and, and it was just a really really sexy design yeah. that i sent to them i said you wanted something from me this this <laughs> is it so uh and they they loved it and uh, i think the knife did really well and people are still asking for it they're, they're asking for a, a v2 of that so i don't know if they're gonna actually go through with it well, so let me ask you bef before you continue, designing an integral, uh, it, does that present a whole new batch of problems? It presents a whole batch of problems for the maker. <laughs> okay, but not for the designer, right? Well, it's, actually, it's actually, uh, it's the same, except okay. you have, yeah, except you don't have to make, uh, you don't have as much clearance for screws in the handle. So you can just have this you know, backspacer, which is a little slimmer. So it's up to the maker to figure out how to get all that stuff in there. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and no, and not everybody can can uh, can has the has the has the uh, uh, machining capabilities to to make something like that. So, yeah, it has to be, and they 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 have limitless, uh, you know, the, their machining skills are, are incredible. So they they really nailed it. Which is the one of your knives? I think it's maybe the baby machine that came out. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like the pocket Santoku, but it has a very milled out hat, uh, handle. Yep, yep. Uh, that, yeah, that was the baby machine. That was uh, project number two, probably I did with them. Yeah. Okay, so so oh, three. There was this. Yeah. Well, and so the one before that, the uh, uh, you know, it's the, much larger. The future, and then the Starboy was a, a smaller version, like a same cousin of the future, smaller. Okay. More EDC friendly, and then the baby machine came. Yeah. Okay, so so does it seem like there's more of a need or desire for the smaller knives? Yeah, they did. Um, they did. Uh, you know, I don't actually go total to full freestyle on them. So they they do have these little requirements. Sometimes they they're going to ask me for something a little smaller. I'll okay. Just plug this in. So uh, so yeah yeah it it seemed obvious, and also you know when I what I was saying about. Uh, the stuff I put out with uh, React and, and other uh, uh, companies like uh, Custom My Factory from out of Russia mm -hmm. um, has to be stuff that I don't actually do myself. So the smaller knives, I, I, I like to build large knives. So the smaller knives I, I, I will do for the production side. So in terms of design, uh, we we know just from looking at your work and kind of uh, looking at the the commonalities across the work, you know you definitely have an aesthetic and you ha you have a design style for sure. How do you balance 
wanting to make something that looks really great to your eye, but also something that feels good in your hand. Ergonomics versus aesthetics. How do you how do you deal with that? That's very interesting because it so happens that when I design, I don't surprisingly enough, I don't really design for aesthetics. I focus almost only on ergonomics. And when you do that, and we were talking about things looking organic and, and muscle-like, when you do that, naturally, it, it kind of flows into, into a movement that looks natural. And uh, the more comfortable a knife is in your hand, the, the better it looks, as far as I'm concerned. When I, when, I, when I design something that's really fully, totally ergonomic and just focus on ergonomics, very often, it looks great. That's it. The eye recognizes, ooh, that's going to, maybe subconsciously without without even thinking right. about it, it's like, that's yeah. going to feel good. That's going to work yeah, right yeah. in my head. Yeah. And anything that flows, you know, it, it'll it, it'll most likely feel good in your hand. What's what's your favorite part of the process of, of designing knives and making them and, uh, you know, being in that that space after work? Um, a lot of the, the steps are, are very exciting. Designing knives is something that I have to do all the time a lot because that keeps everything flowing. You know, when I uh, if I if I make the same knife a little too much, I will very very often make maybe 30 of a of a, of a single model, not more. Uh and then I need to be able to build something else to stay excited about everything. So if I'm building the same knife over and over again, uh everything will wither down and I'm, I just I just won't want to go to the shop and it's, it's, it's not the enthusiasm mm -hmm. really has to do with getting new stuff done. So, so designing a new knife is exciting and then getting, getting the parts uh, cut for it is, is very exciting because even the, even the parts when you, when you get them, I, I have a, f a few things that I uh, outsource in my process. Uh, one of them is water jet, all my blanks mm -hmm. because it just saves me, countless hours on the bandsaw uh and the other is uh my blades get uh surface ground and heat treated outside okay so that's uh, those are the, the only two three things that i get outsourced so uh yeah when, when i get my parts from the water jet I, I kind of you know assemble the, those blanks with all the jagged edges and everything and just look at the knife the way it's gonna the, my new knife the way it's gonna yeah. look and i get it i get really excited about that and then all i want to do is go to the shop and actually get to get this thing done and put it together so yeah that's uh it definitely keeps keeps the juices flowing and that becomes like a limited batch like uh if you were a uh like a, a painter making prints, like you do right. like a series of a thousand prints, get them out. You make them much smaller. So do you number them and sign them? How, um, no, I, I, they all, they all have my makers mark, but I, I never decide how many of, of a model I'm going I'm to okay. make. I just make it till I'm bored. So, uh, like the, the point blank, uh, no, the, uh, the, the SOS son of Sam that I'm making right now, uh -huh. that's probably the longest knife, the longest time I've made a, a single model because I really love it. And I'm not, bored yet about, uh, of making it so that that that's uh you know it just goes to prove that that i don't have this limit in my mind that I, I i will not go past it's just as long as i'm happy doing it i'll do it and uh if if it, if it needs to go it just i just drop it and and move on to the next that's it you being a a creator being a freewheeling creator and it's nice that you don't have a, a huge infrastructure around you that's requiring you, relying you to make a thousand million more baby machines or whatever. It right. Is. You can kind of stay nimble creatively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the reason I, I, I can still go to the shop and work because the, it's just Right, <laughs> right. Are you carrying, do you carry your knives? I don't carry any of my, of my custom knives. Of my, okay. I don't carry a knife that I've made because... I never get on get to hold on to those long enough. Right. Um, every knife maker you talk to, if you ask them if they have one of their own knives, they'll tell you. Well, sometimes I try to make one for myself, and I just I, I get to keep it a couple of weeks, and somebody just grabs it off here. Yeah, yeah. You can't not sell it if you have a great. Yeah, you know, that's it's what like having a thousand bucks sitting in your in your drawer <laughs> or pocket. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I do carry uh, my production designs. Uh, lately, I've been um, carrying a, a, a model that I can't talk about yet, but yeah, a lot. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I can't can, talk I can, about I, it yet. 
It's called Krypton. It's uh, it's made by Riyadh, but it's going to be under my own brand and name. So, oh, cool! Look out for that. Right on. Um, so, uh, another question I have for you is what? And, and I, this might be hard for you to answer because they're kind of all your babies. But what is your best design, in your opinion? What do you think is your most accomplished design as a knife designer? I actually do have a an answer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, when I came up with the platform for the uh, church and the machine, mm -hmm. which are similar platforms, I, I think I kind of peaked for what I, I thought was the best non-flipper design. I, I still don't really know how I can improve upon that because it's just a, a great looking knife and the handle, it's like what we said. Ergonomics are amazing. Mm -hmm. It's got everything I want in a in a non flipping knife, which is a very low cutting edge, big blade, good handle. Everything looks good, and uh, and I I really love that platform. Uh, I I consider them to be very very much alike. Uh, even the, if the 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 church is more of a uh, a food prep one cliff, and the uh, and the baby machine will be more of an EDC everyday task. Uh, but they're very similar, and uh, and those tubes for me are, are actually what I I believe are the perfect uh, thumb opening or you know spider flick uh, whatever you want right. to call it non flipper uh, folding knife designs. And right now, and I'm not going to talk about that model specifically. The Son of Sam, the SOS that I'm I'm making right now, I really love it. I mean, it's uh, I, f I find it to be very sexy, and uh, a knife designer or maker will not drastically go from one model to the other and and completely throw everything uh out the door uh -huh. every single model we make very often as far as i'm concerned at least oh, yeah. is a is a kind of an evolution from the one to the next to the next to the next so if you look at all the knives i've designed over the years very often they will work in little families of similar Kind of, yeah, yeah, philosophy. I, I had to uh, flip over to look at the Son of Sam. I couldn't remember which one, and that is, yeah, that is a really cool. I mean, that that knife has again, it it clicks a lot of boxes for me in terms right. of the blade. It's a clip yeah, point, yeah. but it's also got a recurve. It is sexy. Yeah, the yeah. handle looks like it just melts melts into yeah, the hand. Muscle, yeah, <laughs> muscle, muscle. So how do people follow you? How do people get your knives? Uh, I, I know they're, they're, they're not easy to come by, but yeah. what, how do people find you? Well, I'm, uh, people, the best way actually to follow me is on Instagram because that's uh, where the community is the biggest and it's the easiest way for me to put stuff out there and, uh, and interact. So that's, uh, that's the easiest way to check, check, check me out. I have these phases if I, if I have a little time where I'll make uh, you know, the one-minute format video and try to talk uh, everybody through my process. So um, mm -hmm. if you go back a couple of months ago, I think I, I went through a whole batch of knives explaining each uh, step of the process verbally and uh, in a more descriptive way than, than just taking pictures and, and videos. Um, so sometimes I'll have fun with that. And mostly, you know, you can, you can just keep up with what I'm doing at, at a, any given time and, and uh, you know, projects uh, production pro uh, drops that will happen stuff like that i'm also on, i have also have a, a facebook tashi Burucha design page which is a little less actually more french people on that mm -hmm. um but yeah instagram is the best way uh as far as getting my knives unfortunately uh being part-time i have a, a very limited output so uh, it's not that easy I hear, uh, I get a lot of requests and, and unfortunately I have to you know, tell people that, uh, hopefully, uh, we can meet at a show and, uh, once I get to know you and, you know, maybe we can talk, but I don't have any yeah. order books. I can't, I can't take, I can open any spots. I, I do make knives for shows like Blade, which will most likely be canceled this year, but, yeah. um, I'll try and make a couple of shows, uh, maybe in September or October in the U S. And that's the easiest way for people to get my knife, but even there, you know, a lot of demand. So I have to, I have to do lotteries, but, uh, you know, eventually. Yeah. And, uh, and if you love your designs, you can get into your designs through a number of production uh, right. yeah. avenues. Uh, I, this, this leads me to my very last question, which is what is, what is the future of Tashi Barucha designs? Like, 
uh, as as your other career uh, uh, summits and you <laughs> are we going to see full time knife making? Time? Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. I have. I, I, I don't know. I actually don't. Now more than ever. I can't tell you what tomorrow is going to be made of. I have no idea what's uh, what's what's waiting after this. Uh, I just knew. I just know we're going to be dealing with a brand new world. Yep. Uh, I'm very optimistic about it. I, I think it's just uh, for uh, up to us to make it a better one. I think uh, so. You know, just uh, right now I'm, I'm kind of focused on that and making knives, but uh, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. I find it pretty exciting not to know. Uh, but what I do know is that at some point I will definitely be a full-time knife maker and, uh, that will probably involve getting into a different kind of, uh, business side, just not, not just goofing around the shop and, and right. making shit. So it will maybe be, uh, something more entrepreneurial and, uh, maybe creating a company or something and also making custom knives. Awesome. Well, Tashi, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm, I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. Excellent. And I, I hope uh, I hope everything goes well for you in the, in the near future. And I look forward to meeting you at Blade next year. <laughs> yes, definitely. I, 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 I'm, I'm really, really bummed that, that these shows are not going to be happening because that's the that's my reward in life is, is uh, being able to sell the knives, uh, you know, and seeing the putting the knife into a person's hand and seeing the joy and, and smile on his face. That's uh, there's nothing can beat that. And right now I'm stuck with having to put them in a box and send them overseas. So yeah. hopefully we can get uh, past that. Yeah, we will. No doubt. All right, Tashi, take care. All right, Bob. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My pleasure. Talk soon. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. And we're back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 104. Bob, a, a great interview you had with Tashi Barucha. And, uh, you know, as we joke all the time, uh, we connected to him from France and it was, you know, easy, just like he was yeah, next door. No you were talking at to all. Him. Yeah. And also uh, interesting. Uh, I know you were surprised that uh, you found out he was only a part time. Yeah, I got to say, I was I was shocked. Uh, to me, his designs are so incredibly refined, and then watching him build his knives on Instagram, it's you know, it seems to to be a, a, a labor intensive and painstaking, uh, if not enjoyable, process. So for some reason, I just assumed to become that accomplished, it takes a lot of time, uh, full time work, and. Um, this just goes to uh, point out that Tashi Barucha has talent for knife making. But but he's also putting in the time. He's putting in an hour or two every morning before his full-time job, every evening after his full-time job. So there is time, but there's also that dedication sure, to, sure. to let me craft. Let me clarify what I'm saying. Full-time, he heads up the art department of Clear Channel in France, which is a huge uh, responsibility and creative job. And yet... He still has the time to cultivate uh, skills to make such beautifully uh, uh, elegant and, and nuanced knife designs, as well as has the uh, time and opportunity to work with all these amazing uh, knife makers as collaborators on his projects. I'm just impressed by his bandwidth. You know, th this is a truly creative person. And uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was cool to bask in his presence and hope that some of that uh, creativity <laughs> leaked through the, uh, through the airwaves to me. Well, uh, you know, a lot of times, as our listeners know, I always ask you for your your takeaway. What was the what was the key thing? What is one thing that really kind of stuck with you about the? Well, this is going to sound a little bit fawning, but you know, I was like, you see, if you work hard enough and if you have passion, you can have it all. And it, you know, that sounds a little trite and it sounds a little bit uh, overly simplified. But I was, I was. Uh, you know, I'm constantly thinking about, oh, wouldn't fantasizing about quitting my job and having a life completely in knives, you know, but it's not quite realistic. Mm -hmm. So to see that you can actually have a successful career and then have a successful career in knives at the same time uh, was really inspirational. Plus, just a cool dude and very accessible. And so uh, it just yeah. seems like a good guy. There you go. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us on episode number 104 of the Knife Junkie podcast. If you'd like to hear more interviews like this, our Sunday interview show, as well as our midweek supplemental show where Bob talks about new knife drops, looks at uh, knives in his collection, new knives, knife reviews, and special segments from time to time, 
That's the midweek supplemental episode, so there's two different uh, podcast episodes you get a chance to listen to every week. Plus, Bob has a uh, video show live every Thursday night, Thursday Night Knives. That's at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find out all the details about all those shows at thenifejunkie.com. So, thanks everybody for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.